Hello and uh, good evening. Um, today I am speaking to uh, Michal Esfeld. He's a recurring guest on the podcast. And uh, last time we spoke on the open society and its new enemies. And today we're going to have a conversation, an article he wrote for the uh, Brownstone Institute, which was titled uh, Fiat Money and the COVID Regime Actually um, Existing Postmodernism. Uh, so just, uh, Michal Esfeld, just for introduction, can you maybe tell listeners uh, what, who you are and what you do a little bit? Well, I'm a philosopher of science at the University of Lausanne, and philosophers of science examine the scientific knowledge claims and should critically examine them, and in particular examine them when they are used in politics. So that's so. So I'm doing my job, and that's my main job, I'd say. So you get you get paid to criticize uh, what people say and what they think, and uh, absolute type of claims of these sorts. Well, whether this is all the intentions of the people who pay university professors, I'm, I'm not sure, but that's what they should do. And that's what philosophers did since Socrates. So think of Socrates who acquired with his fellow citizens whether they understood what the good is, he said. Well, so philosophy always had a critical attitude and, and should have it, although it is somehow lost these days. So I hope you're not going to walk in the uh, in the foots of, uh, footsteps of Socrates because yeah. it, didn't, it didn't end very well <laughs> for him. But... Well, yeah, yeah, we are not yet there. I mean, that's already to the point. So when people say they are no longer free to express their views, etc., well, that's not true. I mean, in 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 Europe, in the United States, uh, and what what was the Western world, we are still free to express our views. And when we have concerns about a new sort of collectivism or even totalitarianism coming up, this regime only lives on people believing their narrative. So the Soviet tanks are no longer there. So there is no military dictatorship here. Which, which could impose a somewhat totalitarian rule on the people. So we are there, we should stand up and speak up against narratives which, uh, which are somehow worrisome and in any case not true. So I, I want to sort of get into that point because it sort of ties into the title of, of your article, with the, especially the postmodernism type. Now, postmodernism, as I understood it, and it, it was popular in France, as you know, with Foucault and, and these yeah. type of thinkers, was uh, defined, I think it was Lyotard who called it the incredulity towards the meta narrative. So the, the idea was that you need to criticize totalizing narratives. But um, that doesn't seem to be the way it's being applied today. Uh, you know, can you maybe elaborate on what you understand of postmodernism and even if there is a, a rightful place for that type of thinking? Yes, I mean, you, as an intellectual movement, it started in France, and there's a lot of, there's some sort of an anarchist idea behind it. So this uh, deconstruct, the, the deconstruction of, of these big narratives, and that's fine as far it goes, but when it comes to, 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 to saying that reason human rights and these things also have to be relativized to certain situations, cultures, etc., then we lose what characterizes the modern epoch. So to my mind, the modern epoch is characterized by using reason as a means to limit power. But that, but that implies that you cannot, again, re consider reason as an expression of power. It's just the, 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 the contrast. So think of how this, this alliance between the state and the church uh, broke down in the 17th century. It was by people using their, their own reason and going against this concentration of power and claiming human rights. And this implies that human rights are absolute. They are not open to negotiation. They are not relative to a culture, etc. And when you lose the standard, when you think that this is just one grand narrative and, and uh, then you don't end up with, and that's where the mis mistake lies of these thinkers, you don't end up with everybody living in their own, uh, so to speak, in their own world. Uh, some people, so think of Paul Feyerabend, who was a famous philosopher of science who was also associated with this postmodernism and his slogan, anything goes. 
No, if uh, I mean it's never the case that anything goes. That is, it, it, if you don't have any absolute standards, it means that those who have who are most powerful will impose their standards on you. And that's what we see. That's then the the actually existing postmodernism. So postmodernism as an intellectual doctrine sounds quite anarchist, but it ends up in the in the pure and the naked exercise of power because there's no standard beyond power. Then, if there's no absolute standard, if everybody has their own standard, then we are back to who has the most, uh, who is, has the strongest voice, will impose their standards on other people. And that's the danger. But uh, how has it how has it been that that some of these philosophers and and, and your I mean a philosopher as well I mean um, yeah uh, how is it they came to reason to the point that they discard objectivity as a tool as as a means of and reason and logic and and you know it's it sounds you know just to, to violate common sense in, on a certain level. Now, yeah, you. You can say in their favor that, of course, now, now think of science, and one often describes the scientific point of view as a point of view from nowhere. Okay, so you abstract from all subjective cultural influences, etc. Mathematics, physics, chemistry, biology is the same in Europe, in the United States, in China, and Africa, everywhere around the around the globe. But of course, you can never reach objectivity in the full sense. A point of view from nowhere would not make any sense. It would not be a point of view anymore. You always have a, a particular point of view. But the issue now is that science tries to abstract from all these subjective elements that divide us and tries to reach objectivity. So it's a, a regulative idea in the Kantian sense. It's something that you use as guide, although you can never quite reach it. And when you abandon it, then 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 the whole thing breaks down. So what is justified is just is, is that if someone claims that all they are, that, that, that their theories are just objective, etc., that's not true. But they strive for objectivity, and you reach it through. That's also very clear from Descartes through scepticism, for methodological scepticism. So scrutinize any. Uh, any claim, any knowledge claim that, that someone has subjected to criticism, etc. That's the way we can reach objectivity. Mm. So and objectivity, it's also about criticizing the method at the ultimate. It's um, criticizing the method, of course. I mean, you improve your, 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 your knowledge, you improve your method, but the rule to be critical, to be, sept to be skeptical, but but in a in a quiet I mean discipline not not just say that in a, I mean in a disciplined way um, the asking for evidence asking for argument uh, putting the stuff to to to, to experiments etc that's uh, that's what that's the means to reach objectivity and so far as we can reach it okay so I, I get to a line you said in your article which was in science authority plays no role yeah. one has to provide evidence and argument for the claims one make and these claims are subjected to scrutiny and we talked a little bit about the scrutiny but i want to get a bit to the authority type because we've been hearing this in the last two years and it's probably when climate science has been there for the last 20 years that the science is settled and you as an ordinary person are incapable of thinking for yourself and you must just accept what we wise guys tell you. Now, why, again, why is that wrong? I mean, go back, it goes back to Plato, right? To, to, to the idea that there are some experts and in Plato it was the philosophers who have some sort of privileged knowledge and this entitles them to rule over other people. Now, and for, for Plato's sake, one should say that he had this, this idea of a knowledge of, of abstract ideas, which gives you moral qualification, etc. Now, if you go to modern science, there's nothing of that. It's, I mean, because it is objective, it's just about facts. So no, you cannot follow the science. That's complete nonsense. I mean, you can follow a religion. You can follow you. You may have certain beliefs and preferences. You can follow them, but you cannot follow science because it's only about facts and not about norms. And these, and these facts are not, there is no, the, 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 I mean, if when someone says science is settled, you know that it's wrong because you'd never have to say that science is settled, okay? So if someone tells you as an other adult person that, uh, that he, consuming heroin or cocaine is dangerous for your health, okay? 
you, you, you can verify this, etc. You have evidence. You don't have to add, and that is settled. Adding that, and that is settled, does not add any content. So you make a statement, you give the argument, and you give the evidence. Now, in education, when you have to do with adolescents and, and uh, you have to prevent them from consuming drugs, and, and they, they, they have to learn, they are not yet, they have not fully developed their mind, you may use an authoritative statement such as that is settled. But never with adult people, you just give the evidence. And in and, and climate science, uh, it is not settled because it, this is based on models, and models are not objective. And the, look, go back to Descartes, the, the Cartesian science just is uh, a geometry and dynamics. And uh, the problem with that is that even if you have the laws, you don't know and control the initial conditions. That's how statistics comes in. That's how model building then comes in later because you are unsure about the initial condition, but uh, the conditions, but already this tells you that you can never be sure. There's always a range of which parameters you take into account, how you take them in account, and what initial values uh, you, you, you set for them. So you cannot have a settled science because a, a science that is based on, on models can never be settled because then the knowledge of what the relevant parameters are, of what their what what values should be set for them, increases as we gather more evidence. Yeah. So that's uh, so the, the 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 thing is that in the concrete case, but, but the science there's is also an implicit assumption in 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 this type of thinking, which is that uh, we have the ability ability of seeing the future. Um, you know, with our model that, you know, we, we laugh at uh, a doomsday prophets uh, usually in some countries. Some people still believe them, but generally speaking, we, we're critical of them and we derate them. But yet when it comes with a mathematician and a guy in a lab coat, we say, oh, great, we're going to follow the model. Like, you know, Niels Ferguson's <laughs> famous model. Yeah, yeah, it you know, was a yeah, that was all wrong because yeah, you 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 see that was all wrong. I mean, the first and foremost mistake was this what 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 Popper pointed out as as scientism that you have to do with human beings. They are not like physical objects. So if you give human beings that the that the information that the virus spreads, they will adapt their behavior. It's so trivial. So the model which tells you that unless the government intervenes with lockdowns, uh, that there will be an exponential spread of infections is, I mean, you know, a priori that can't be true because if there is something dangerous going on, people will adapt their behavior in accordance with their risk profile. So if you're at risk of an infection and you know that a virus circulates, you take certain precautionary measures when going out and you you adapt your behavior. And that alone is sufficient to prevent an, 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 an exponential spread of the virus. Then they had completely wrong ideas about what the, how dangerous that virus is, what the infection fatality rate is, etc. So as a model, as a warning, as saying, look, that could happen in the worst case scenario. It may be quite helpful to alert people and to say, okay, think what you should do to prevent this, but not as a piece of, of prediction of the future and as an instrument for political advice. Then mm -hmm. it went completely wrong. But this is, you see, what, what, what this guy Ferguson, what, what, what should he have done? If he had been just a decent scientist, he would say, okay, there, 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 there's, a, there's a whole range of scenarios. It may be that, that nothing happens. It may be that, uh, that a catastrophe happens. It may be anything in between. We just don't know. Well, if Boris Johnson would have sent him home, and, and that would be, <laughs> I mean, that would be the best thing because let the scientists do um, um, their stuff and the politicians do do their stuff and, uh, and and don't mix with them. Don't think that you can base politics on alleged science. That does not make sense. But the, the other th aspect that comes into here is the aspect of groupthink. And we saw a lot of this during the pandemic. I mean, I, I remember reading your book, uh, you know, on philosophy of science a few years ago and reading a first time that I came across the idea of the paradigm change, which is essentially groupthink in science to make it simple. Yeah. And yeah. how the tribe kicks out the heretics. And I thought, OK, that was an interesting case in an abstract field i never thought i would experience it and COVID, <laughs> exactly. I, yeah. COVID, I got a real-time replay of that uh, on tv you know 
Yeah, yeah. That's it. I mean, that's that's one of the further issues why objectivity can never be taken for granted. We know this since Thomas Kuhn, there is this paradigm and group thinking. But if it go, I mean, if science is left on its own, there will always be people who speak up, who criticize this, and the argument, I mean, authority will never will never pass through and, and, and just, you, you would not, if a student asks a question and if a professor says, I'm the professor, shut up, that, that this does not pass, this does not pass among colleagues either. And that's the way science changes and makes progress, that there is, uh, that there is no mechanism there to, to suppress uh, criticism. And when politics steps in, when the media step in, when they present certain scientists as the spokesperson for of science, when they pretend that there's an expert consensus or anything this, of course, then it becomes a, then it becomes a poor power play. So there always is this group thinking, and and we are all to a certain extent prone to it, but we we, we can install mechanisms to prevent it from 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 overreaching to control it just by fostering criticism by allowing for criticism and by not having an external power such as the state interfere with the science yeah, and and that i suppose is, is the danger in having a uh, government uh, or state um, invested in a certain outcome or in a certain uh, scientific theory because there exactly. is it becomes very difficult, if not impossible, to overturn that. Yeah. Now, look, if if we had a situation in which the government had abstained, a different scientist would have put forward different models. OK, so suppose some 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 businessmen might have been frightened, so they may have shut down their businesses. Others have kept uh, have kept them open. Now, if you see if those who keep their businesses open uh, become ill, have to go to hospital, of course, everybody will shut down their business. So the point is that you don't know from the outset what is right. And if you just let it go, you, it's much easier to correct. I think of, of mask mandates and these things. Of course, some people would have worn masks out of their own. Some people would have locked them in. Some businesses would have said when the vaccination would, would be available, we let only uh, vaccinated people in our pub or restaurant, et cetera. And then you would see, and if you don't see a difference, if, if these measures have no effect, they will be quickly corrected because people have to bear the cost. And that's but, the point. If you don't, so so if you let plural in this case, no, no, I'm in favor of anything goes. I mean, this models that uh, that is the right <laughs> attitude. So so if you give, if you say these are possibilities that may happen, but there's no guarantee that any one of them happens, and it's not predictions. Now now let's try and and let people. So some people are more frightened than others. And then you see, I mean, if you see that, that, that there really is something dangerous going on and those who don't wear masks or, or, or who don't take a vaccination or whatever it may be, they become ill, then of course the thing will be settled. Then it is settled by the by the evidence and the other other people will follow suit and, and those who don't do will have to bear the consequences. There's but, but, never but a need for a state intervention there. But, but what you're actually saying to me is with all the talk of following the science, uh, we were quite ignorant of the scientific method. I mean, at least yes, the politicians yes. were. Yeah, yeah, the politicians were the, I mean, politicians are not interested in science. I mean, a politician is it takes up anything they can get to legitimize their actions, and and they want to appear as as being active, as doing something for the people, etc. I mean, the best politician is the politician who does nothing, I guess. So so let let things go. Most of the time, they they do. Uh, I mean, they should ensure that there's a judiciary that there's a, i mean that there's a, that there's protection that there's security etc but they, they shouldn't interfere with economy science education and things like that media <laughs> the thing. yeah the media the media is another one here which is uh, which also plays a role in here. i want to get to the, the other part of your of your article which is a fiat currency um now, you know, when I read this thing, I asked myself, what does fiat currency have to do with postmodernism? And can we maybe elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, it's a fiat creation of a reality, isn't it? I mean, if, uh, I mean, before 1971, 
you had the, the currencies tied to gold. I mean, not not in a not in a fully covered way, but but at least in a partial way, in the sense that the U.S. dollar was defined at uh, the, at one thirty fifth of an of an ounce of uh, of gold, and not U.S. citizen, but but foreign nationals via their central banks could exchange dollars into gold. And now the United States started the Vietnam uh, engaged in the Vietnam War. There was this uh, this welfare state with Johnson's Great Society, so they printed much more money. And of course, they couldn't print gold, so the uh, so they they, they 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 would soon have lost their gold. So they had to face the choice either to to adopt the I mean their their, their budget to to to, to 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 the real basis that they have, or to, to create a reality out of nothing, so to speak, by printing money which is not tied to anything anymore. And then after, at the end, I mean, Kissinger settled this with the petrodollar regime. Then, then Volcker and 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 Reagan reduced the uh, fourth uh, fourth inflation, and that worked for for some decades. I would say it worked until about the year 2000, when when Greenspan then began to bail out um, a hedge fund, and that afterwards everybody was more or less uh, uh, bailed out, uh, and and ever more money was printed, and we see the consequences now in terms of inflation. So the point is that you create a reality out of nothing. I mean, just by fiat, by authority, you say, this is money now. And then you use coercion, the, the, the power of the state, to impose this, uh, this on people. And the link with the pandemic is that this is a means now at the, the, at the disposal of the state that they can use to I would say to destroy or to 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 make people not no longer use their own reason and their own judgment. I mean, if the consequences, if the costs of these uh, lockdown measures would have been transparent from the beginning, people would have to think about whether it's worth paying these costs for 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 unclear benefits or even worse, uh, the, those creating even more damages. I mean, we are never in an ideal situation. The means are always scarce. So we always have to think about what's the best uh, manner to make use of, of scarce means to reach our aims. And now yeah. you pretend that you could just print money and... Uh, and and bail everybody out so they could close their businesses, stay at home, and nevertheless get paid. And and I mean the way the pandemic was sold to us, or the lockdown was sold to us, was you know three weeks to flatten the curve. If you if we still believe that, and it ended up being two years. What is it? Two and a half years. Yeah, but, and some but, countries are still thinking of going back into lockdown now. You know. So yeah, yeah, but but for the say, I mean to be to be fair with Ferguson. The paper, I mean, the scientists were clear about that, that it's not an issue of three weeks lockdowns, but the plan was lockdowns more or less. So, so you could have periods of easing in between until there's herd immunity for vaccination. And then the vaccination did not work as they planned, but, but but it was clear. I mean, this was perhaps how this was sold with this flattening the curve, which which uh, I mean, I never underst really understood the logic because if you just flatten the curve, you get the same number of infections, of death, etc., only uh, over it, a longer it, it period. Propaganda. So propaganda. I mean, uh, Donald yeah. Trump. I remember him standing on that screen, and he had this bell curve behind him. And I asked myself, does he even know what is a bell curve? You know, he was just pointing yeah, at the he, curve. He didn't. He probably didn't didn't know. But again, for, to be to be honest, with Trump, when he realized, I mean, he realized that he was cheated, and then he brought in people like Scott Atlas at his advisor into the White House. They didn't know. Uh, Scott Atlas wrote a book afterwards about his time at the at the White House, and what I found, I mean, really worrisome in the book was how how he described that even Trump, the president, with all its power, could not go against the administration and the so-called deep state. So a guy like, like Fauci was there for decades and had all the apparatus behind him so they could let Trump do his show and uh, and uh, go on. So Trump rather soon realized that, uh, that, uh, that there was something wrong. Yeah, I think it's... And of course... 
yeah, you, you know, think of one, think of someone like Ronald Reagan or Margaret Thatcher again. I think they had enough, they were firm and, and, and values like freedom that they would not have done such a thing. And well, so this yeah. was also a problem. The world did not have a, an American president or a British prime minister or a French president for that matter, who really was credible and standing for human rights, freedom, et cetera, and say, okay, they do such things in China, which is a totalitarian state, but in a Western democracy, in an open society, we don't do such things. End of stories. And send scientists uh, who, who who make courts and that sends just just home again to let, let, and tell them that they should do their work. And not well, do I, it I remember a quote from uh, Freeman Dyson from years ago. You know, he passed away, I think, during the pandemic, and he, he said something about the climate scientists. And I think we can apply the same rule to the pandemic or to everyone. He said it's, it's, it's a lot like the people in the military. You know, the people who went into the war on terror and now they're seeing terrorists all over the place and you can't yeah. get them out of that mindset. So you, you need to intervene. You need to sometimes put your foot down and say, guys, now it's enough, you know, because there's always going to be a virus killing somebody. There's always going to exactly. be a terrorist. There's always going to be... Uh, there's always going condition. to be climate change, etc. Now you should, uh, and you are right. I mean, these scientists, they will always be there and and somehow there's nothing wrong with it there's nothing wrong with having someone pointing to potential dangers but the the point is that they have to be stopped at the right moment so some other scientists have to jump in and to say hey, come on show me the evidence please not just uh, arbitrary model calculation what have some evidence of what uh, uh, of what is going on there so the control mechanism should be within science uh, and then it should be clear also via the media, et cetera, that we are not living in a platonic state where scientists dictate to society or people what they should do and what they should not do. It's, I mean, for modern science with, with its uh, aspiration to objectivity, that's complete nonsense because, as I said already be, be, be before, objectivity means you can discover only facts and from facts no norms follow okay so it is a fact that smoking is dangerous for your health but it does not follow from that fact that you should smoke or that smoking is immoral or whatever it follows only that you should not put in danger other people i mean that you should that, that there could be some restrictions on smoking in public spaces and and things like that but it does nothing follow and it does not even follow even the statistics don't tell anything about individual person so it may be that 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 by smoking you prevent health ease in an individual case so that it may even be healthy for for particular persons to smoke that's all well i i've, I've even looked at the evidence at, at second hand smoking and i'm not as convinced that um, it's rigorous now it's not a battle i'm prepared to fight because i don't smoke it's, and i tend to not like smokers yeah. but yeah, uh, exactly. I, i'm not if i'm scientifically objective if i look at the evidence in the meta studies it's questionable if secondhand smoking is as bad as it said. Firsthand smoking, yeah, I think the link between our lung cancer is, is pretty strong and sure for your own health that might be the case. But be that as it may, you know, smoking you can understand in some extent, but also you yeah. can take it to a point of absurdity. You know, you can say no smoking in society, and that's what South Africa did during the lockdown. And guess what? People were selling illegal cigarettes in the process. Of course, yeah, that's that's what happened. That's like like happened like like these times when when consuming alcohol was prohibited in the United States. But that I mean, I'm not an expert in this. I didn't go into the details. But but there are also I mean that that seems somehow in dispute because also I mean serious people say that passive smoking that there are secondary that there are serious secondary effects. Maybe or may not be, but just take this as an example. So there can be cases in which science discovers negative effects for right. health. But even if science discovers this, no norms follow. The only thing that follows is given the norm that you must not endanger. I mean, you use your freedom, but in using your freedom and having and exercising your freedom rights, you have the obligation to respect those very rights of everybody else. So same law, same rights for everybody. So you must not interfere with the exercise of uh, freedom of, of other people. You must not endanger them. And of course, if someone claims that they, that they are endangered by the behavior of someone else, they have to bring evidence, etc. And 
and there may be cases, and there are cases. I mean, you cannot handle, right? You must not handle with radioactive substances, for instance. You, you put other people uh, in danger. So that's clear. There are scientific facts, and these scientific facts tell us when. I mean, look at, at this 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 woke culture. So you may feel uneasy if you see um, um, how some people the, the clothes of, of some people, what 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 they wear, what 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 hair fashion they ha have, etc. But it's purely subjective. Okay, so you need now a criterion. When does the behavior? Of, of someone interfere with the legitimate exercise of freedom of other people. So you cannot complain if you don't like the, uh, the what what uh, the clothes someone wear on the how how they cut their hair etc. Whether they have a beard or, or, or how what their makeup is or whatever or or whether they wail themselves or what, whatever they are free to to do all this that's purely subjective even it can be unpleasant for you and you may even get uh, you you may even feel sick when you see some people etc but but that's purely subjective you need some objective facts and there are objective facts and we need objective facts to settle such conflicts and issues because otherwise it would be a pure again a pure power play Mm. So the postmodernists always made the claim that power is uh, predicated on stories, on narratives. Yes. Um, you know, and, and, and what you're actually saying here, if, if, you know, is, is sort of in a certain sense an agreement, which is that if everyone believes its own narrative, you know, you can only ex use that to exercise power because there is no more basic standard to, to measure yeah. to compare about. But, but the point now is with this postmodernism that we see now, that even if you, if, if you remove the big narratives, they are removed. The, the communist narrative is removed. The, the narrative about genes and races is, is, is removed. You get small narratives. And these small narratives can be as totalitarian as the big ones when they, when they, are, the only when they are the only game in town. And what makes this postmodernism so dangerous is that you can switch from one narrative to the next one. So you have the corona narrative. And if this no longer works, and now the facts become ever more evident, okay, then you switch to the climate narratives. And uh, in a hundred years, I don't know when the, 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 the there will be the end of the world. You cannot nine, check. Nine it's not a prediction. <laughs> it's not a prediction like the Ferguson model that by summer we'll be all dead. Or I remember this, this was this was even more interesting Draghi and other politicians saying that the unvaccinated they will all be dead by next spring and i'm still alive yes okay <laughs> so, so they are they are refuted and if this were so they'd say yeah well why do you care i mean why do you oppose discrimination against unvaccinated people according to your prediction they will all be dead soon so you could just relax and wait until they are until they are dead now this prediction was quickly pretty much quick refuted. But if you say in a hundred years we will all die of climate change, I mean, you would have to wait a hundred years to refute that. So that's uh, that's uh, not so... It, it sounds, I mean, I read a book not that long ago about by Christopher Booker on scare stories and he went through all of them from the ozone layer to global warming, you know, to food scares, things that I didn't even yeah. know of. Um, and, and, and his conclusion at the end was, look, he's not an expert, he's just a journalist, but all of them seem to be at best overblown, you know, even if there was yeah. a fear. And, and, and it would just seem that, that, that the humans struggle with this, this idea of how do we come to grips with risk at the end of the day? How do we, we sort of manage this thing without overreacting and, as you say, blowing a hole into the fiscal budget by expanding the debt and printing more money? Yeah. Yeah, and that's where the faculty of judgment, Urteilskraft in German, faculty de jugement, can comes uh, comes in because it's not. I mean, you give this 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 the scientists, you tell them a virus circulates, and then they say, okay, if you lock everybody in, then they cannot. If they have no social contact anymore, they cannot get infected. That's a trivial statement. You don't even need a scientist for that. Right. And then they say, now we as scientists, it's consensus that you should do this. That's complete nonsense because now you would have to weigh and you would say, okay, look, if even if if 
elderly people who may be in danger, even if they lock themselves in, they may, I mean, what would the negative effects of social isolation have to be uh, taken into account? The negative, so, so you need judgment to weigh all these issues. Again, there's nothing wrong with, with there being some people, they say, look, there's a danger there, there's a virus coming. I mean, there is a there is climate change there's a way you can you can improve energy consumption so nuclear energy is much more efficient much more safe than than burning coal for instance so so there there there, there are real issues there and now you need you you have to you have to weigh them you need the uh, you need the overall picture and the scientists do them you just tell they say there's a b tell there's a virus and then they say lock down or there's someone you, you tell them there's climate change and, and that co2 may may play a role in it and then they say okay go for net zero and 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 uh, shut down your uh, destroy your economy and then you have net net zero i mean that what is lacking there is this, this the, the, the faculty of judgment to say, but hey, if we do that, what will be the consequences? Mm. And, and how many people will die uh, as an effect of, of, of such radical measures? And then you somehow have to weigh all these issues. And that's what in their good days politicians should do, even if some scientists uh, become mad, then politicians would have to say, well, we have to take into account this, this, uh, there's a, that and that, and there's uh, there's no evidence that the only danger is, is a virus or climate change, and we will die all of the, all from that. Yeah, I, I mean, like you're making an argument here, basically, for trade-offs and and, and sort yes. of ju good judgment thinking, and and you know, because because there was another thing that I sort of want to get your opinion on during the pandemic, and that is that we did not want to believe anything unless it went through a peer-reviewed journal. You know, this is sort of another saying that came through the media. It was a propaganda saying. If it's not peer-reviewed science, the fact-checkers don't accept it, you know. Now, to review a peer-reviewed journal or an article takes like half a year, a year or something. There's no time for that, and it's not necessary. And I don't even think you can evaluate something as complicated as a society on the basis of, a, you know, on a peer-reviewed Yeah, study. yeah, but... but, but... Peer review has a good use in science. You need it. I mean, if it works well, you need some, but that's just a critical attitude. So some, someone makes claims, according to Popper, they should make bold, audacious claims, and then someone else has to check them. And it works, I think it works well to the extent that, that there is no external interference. Right. When there's external interference, then, then other then other interests than, than just purely scientific ones come in and then it becomes a question of political correctness. And of course, much could be said about peer reviewing becoming a business, whether it prevents innovation, et cetera. But there has to be some sort of internal control at science. It will never be perfect, but if you just yeah, go but, but I mean, to, 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 to sort of elaborate my point is there were some preprint publications coming out earlier saying this treatment might work, it wasn't certain. Um, some people were saying let's use it and not you know to go into the details of the treatment but um, or some people were just running blogs sometimes and saying look I've got shown that this thing is exaggerated and then when somebody in the media made that point to say look um, an analysis by a statistician for example showed you know Ferguson might be wrong um, for example uh, that was just disregarded because it's not peer reviewed it didn't fall part of the follow the science crowd if you will yeah, but, but that's because science did not function well because of external influences. And of course, mm -hmm. because some scientists jumped on the bandwagon and that's the way how they gained popularity. And the other thing is when it comes to new medical treatments, etc., you can say, okay, it may be an emergency or you need them. Well, those, I mean, I'm also, I mean, I don't have any objection to adult people taking drugs. I mean, if they do it for their own, if they don't put anyone sure. else in danger, they may do what they wish. So some, so people can propose or can say, okay, here's a new, here's a new medical treatment. We have not checked it properly, but if you want to take it, take it. It's on your own risk. And I think, of course, that they would have to, that those who who, who put this forward have to ensure responsibility. So have to be, have to take civil responsibility for damages, et cetera, which is not the case with the vaccines either. 
But otherwise, we are in a situation in which we don't know, and so you should not pretend to know. That's the that's the problem. So if you think that proper proper testing, peer reviewing, and whatever takes too much time, you are free to 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 to, to do or to take uh, whatever whatever yeah. you want at your own risk. Yeah, because because that then, happened in many countries in the world that people were just taking medication randomly. They didn't die, as far as I can tell. It's questionable yeah. if the medication worked. I mean, I didn't. There's no randomized control, so you don't really know for certain. But yeah. you know that, that sort of thinking. You you know the the the, the peer review process at times become an ideological filter, and as you say, that's probably a consequence of the of the intervention intervention was there. You know, the political yeah, but, but you have randomized studies for for medical treatments, etc. But it would it would take it takes time, and the things get settled. And we know from the studies about the vaccines. I mean, Peter Doshi published this last last August. When you analyze the data they made available, and they didn't make all the data available, but even from the available data, you see if applied to the general population, this does more harm than good. So there are more side effects than, than, than serious cases prevented for the simple reason that in the general population, this, this virus is not very dangerous. So you, and then you have to make up your mind and then take your decision what, what, what you want to do yourself. If you want to get such, such treatments, that vaccination, if you don't want to get it, I mean, there's nothing. I'm also, I'm, I'm not in favor either of, of prohibiting the things who knows they are, they, they are used. I mean, they are certainly no. useful and I mean, certainly, but it seems that they are useful in preventing some infections. They are, they may be useful. There's some evidence for people at risk. Etc. So, so let them decide themselves. Yeah, what well, would we'll decide with their doctors or whatever? Have a process in place, and that that was also yeah. missing. Uh, other part of your article you touched on is the future of freedom, and and you sort of, um, I mean, you spoke a little bit to this already, but you know, why is this uh, type of thinking that we just talked about so dangerous to human rights and freedom and, and prosperity? I mean that the. the, the there are three, I would say there, 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 there are three points. The first point is what I would call epistemic humility. That's what we should have learned after, after Plato, that no one is in the possession of the knowledge of the good for everybody. We have partial knowledge, we have some objective knowledge, we have values, etc. But no one has a normative knowledge that would entitle them to tell other people what they should do. When they claim this, uh, some religion did this, when, when, when science does this, which is becoming now another form of religion, it always went wrong. So epistemic humility, there, there, there may be some, some, there may be the absolute good, I don't know, but in any case, there's no one identifiable who has the knowledge of it. Price didn't, uh, scientists don't, and politicians certainly do not. So first, epistemic humanity. The second thing is, is, is human freedom. When you, when you think about something, you are free to, we are free to make up our mind. We are not like, like animals, like other animals, just subject to sense impressions, to instincts, to needs. We can position ourselves with respect to them. I can think about how, what, what, what beliefs I shall adopt, what I shall do. So we have this, this human freedom. And on that basis, we have freedom rights. Everybody has the right to make up their mind themselves. And then we see at the third point is we see the consequences. So a society that lets people free, that let people develop their, 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 their capacities, that let people freely interact, it works much better. It's for, for everybody. Think of the, the technological progress, the economic progress, and the progress in protecting the environment. So just look at the Soviet empire. It was terrible as regards protection of environment, but this just comes with, with technological progress and economic progress. And this comes if you let, let, let people do, and you have a judicial, a judiciary in place that, uh, that makes sure that there is the same law applied to everybody. But then, so we have these three points: no, 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 no knowledge of the of the good. We know that we are free. We have the freedom, and we we have seen we, we have, from history. We have a lot of. I mean, we know which which political regime works and which one does not work. 
And it, it, it also comes down to the idea that, I mean, in, in you know, the French uh, discourse, they always define totalitarianism as what La Ponce unique, you know, the unique type of thinking. Yes. And that, that I think, is, is, is definitely part of this, this story as well, that you can't really manage a, 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 a society on a single variable or a few variables. You need to yes. have a sense of pluralism and decentralized shared intelligence. Exactly, decentralized chat intelligence and people know themselves what is good for them. So there's this arrogance of scientists that they say, God said them, okay, so so just let this go on. Why not? I mean, let people make the decision and say, no, no, they can't do it. We have to tell them what to do. They are irresponsible. This is this platonic attitude that there's somehow an elite who has better knowledge and who is morally qualified to tell other people what to do. But come on. They don't have the better knowledge. I mean, they have some knowledge in, in, in some areas. We know a lot about the, like, the laws of physics. We have the specialized knowledge. Engineers can uh, can uh, build uh, planes that get us over the Atlantic or to South Africa to the other end of the world in less than a day. Is that we have that knowledge, but we have no knowledge of a of a common good or an absolute good. We have no normative knowledge. So, so that right. should be that's the, that's the key. Yeah, is the normative knowledge to yeah. you know to tell others and what, that's what and that's do. and people are different. They have different preferences. So so in Switzerland, a lot of people go hiking. But it's very dangerous. I mean, I mean, they, 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 they a number of people are um, are dying. So I had a student. I remember a student, a master student. They wrote an essay about the risk of of alpinism, and and he said he had the risks under control, but unfortunately he died at this. At this. No, and I... so, but but I mean, they if they so so if uh, going for alpinism is a value for their life. And if they are adults and if they are not indoctrinated, if no one put them under influence of drugs, no one bribed them, they have to weigh their risk for themselves. And I would never do such a thing. So that's, that's for me, it sounds too risky, but maybe I'm doing, I'm doing things that other people uh, consider foolish. So there's no, there's no shared, I mean, there, there, there are different interests, there are different preferences, and that makes human society so rich that there is this pluralism and richness. And so there can't be just one way of thinking, which is the, the, the correct way. And the totalitarianism is based on this. And it's always this one way of thinking is always justified by science. It is always taken to overrule human rights. That's what we see now. So science tells us. So I saw many, even even liberal politicians here. I mean, which which who are members of a party which calls itself liberal, but which is not. Uh, I mean, it's not liberal in the classical sense of liberal. But anyway, they told you, But but you and your program, it's it's about freedom of human rights. And they said, yeah, but this time the scientists told us we have to do it the rubbish so so what are your values uh, if 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 a scientist comes and tells you you have to lock people in they have uh, they, they are no values anymore or what is uh, what is going on there so we need this 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 uh, this pluralism because people are different but will we always have in authority this type of uh, tendency to to go the platonic route and isn't that maybe the lesson of this whole pandemic is that even the best person on the stressful panic situations will go you know uh, totalitarian yes they, i mean I, i'm not sure whether they will go totalitarian but we always have this tendency we always had in history so what i think is you then that's where this fiat money story comes in again so the only thing you can do is to prevent them to have the means to impose this on society so if you have a state that has the control about money printing that intervenes in in the economy that intervenes that controls education that finances a lot of media so in europe we have these these compulsory financing for 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 television and uh, and radio we have a quasi monopole of the state financing education and and science we have a state intervention in the economy we have laws so so in switzerland the emergency I always thought the only emergency was a military aggression so if someone in the, invades the country but then i learned oh no they have a law about an epidemic being an, an epidemic, being an emergency, and they can use the same power even as if there were a military aggression and say, come on, something has gone wrong now. So if if there is this this 
this concentration of power in the hand of the state, then of course there is the possibility to seize this power for the interest of certain groups. So what, what Popper called scientists, uh, people who think that science should rule society, they will always be there and they have the right to express their views, of course. There's not, I mean, the views are wrong, but, but uh, I mean, everybody has the right to express their views and other people have the right to think that their views are, are wrong, but they cannot seize then a state authority that imposes this. Now think again, think of this vaccination campaign. So, so they may develop vaccines, of course, but then people would have to pay for getting vaccinated. There would be no pressure if there were no state and they would have to be liable. No one could, could, could bail them out of their liability. And then you can think of what, what happens. Everyone who has a business has the right to say that, that, that to exclude, I mean, there are no, there's no obligation. So, so. Well, if you, you talk thinks... about that, the interesting thing that will come in, in, in South Africa now, in uh, one journalist pointed this out, our law is a bit unique in this regard. Some companies forced people to get vaccinated, not the government. Yes. The government have imposed it. And now the companies can legally be held liable if there were side effects. Okay, so yes. not the vaccine yes. companies, but the companies who made those yes. laws. And that's, that's a very good thing because also in the medical doctors can be held liable because if it is, is say, suppose you inherited a million dollars, okay? And now you, you, you go to a bank and the bank size and it tells you invest in the NASDAQ and then the NASDAQ crashes. And, and of course, the, 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 the bank is liable or, or those who gave it for, for, for having given foolish advice to you. That's why you have to sign a paper that, that, they, that they told you about the risk of investment decisions, etc. And if they didn't do, they are liable. Now, if you vaccine people on a chain as they did, so, so no one was, was really um, um, uh, there was no uh, no 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 uh, no information about the risk, so the doctors are liable. So I remember in, in Switzerland uh, the, the, when this uh, the, in these hot days, I got emails from doctors who said, "Okay, a patient came into my um, into my." Um, into my cabinet and and they showed me an article and an interview of yours and asked me whether they should get vaccinated. So I had I could not simply vaccinate them. So the way well, that's that's what they should do. And you saw your patients, so you can't tell them that why this is wrong. What what I said, but they complained at me and said you have to stop this because patients come now and ask questions. You should do. Of course, the doctor, the doctors who did this, the medical doctors, of course, they are liable. If yeah. patients had uh, had damages, health damages to that, and I think this is necessary. I mean, I don't want to attack any individual, but I think that it is necessary for the for the well functioning of society that doctors who did this that uh, that that they have faced the responsibility, because well, then it won't the happen again. Well, and and the more importantly to me, the the basic law that nineteen eight it's a nineteen eighty four law, which is a very strange year to pass such a law that that allows the vaccine companies to, to uh, I mean that was to, to, to not be held liable. That was Ronald La Reagan's administration being lobbied by the okay. pharmaceuticals. Oh dear, yeah, yeah. I didn't I didn't remember that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and of... I mean, it, it was just pure corruption. It was probably an innocent yes. law at the time. And at that time, as I understand it. Uh, disease was so low that outside of polio and smallpox and serious diseases, vaccines were, you know, not really as serious for most kids, even measles. Uh, those companies yeah. sometimes made profits, sometimes made a loss. It was a very good system. And then the government of Fauci and them convinced the government to say, look, uh, people are going to die of disease and bugs and death, and therefore we need to pass this law to, to remove that. Now, what's yeah, going to happen if you remove a liability law? Of course yeah, they're going to abuse course. the system. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. here we are. That's, that's the, and there we are. But if you didn't have a state that intervened, I mean, if you just had a function in judiciary, no one could remove you from the by civil liability. I mean, not criminal ones. There. I mean, if, if criminal intentions are there, that's something else. But no right. one can remove your civil liability. So you need, as a medical doctor or whatever, as professional, you need an insurance. And the insurance company will look, they won't insure foolish things that you, that you may do. So I think the, the, the economy, if it's just led by its own, would, would, would settle this issue. Because you have mm -hmm. liability, everybody has liability. 
they need insurances and insurance companies insure only risks that they can that they can calculate so well, there, there, there was one economist that... who uh, suggested years ago, uh, Ross McKittrick, who's a um, Canadian economist, he suggested that the climate debate can be settled by tying the carbon tax to the temperature rise. So if we increase the temperature of the earth, the companies would pay more tax and then they will have better forecasting methods and we will see who bets the best against emissions. Yeah. You know? So he was he was yeah. proposing a risk mechanism like this to try and, and, and settle the debate, you know, and maybe we should look like to solutions of that sort, you know, to try and and work out the game theory yeah. yeah but in any case we should remove the power of government to privilege certain companies or certain industry under the pretext of uh, of the common good so what happened here and we know that there was a lot of bribery involved if you look at the eu commission and i read that the husband of ursula von der leyen was promoted by one of these pharmaceutical companies, et cetera. So there was a lot of bribery going on. If, if there's no one, I mean, if you just have a functioning judiciary, no one can, can remove a liability. Also, if you run a lab and to gain a function research in the lab, then you cannot just say society has to bear the risk. You have to insure the risk. You have to find an yeah. insurance company, and that would settle a lot of issues of, of what is but, but, going this is also there. part of the of the of the fiat story because the fiat story says the government does not carry the risk. You know, of yeah. or the risk would be our pockets, and we would vote out the politicians. And fiat somehow allows them, you know, has removed that risk from from yeah. the political process. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's so so I think you cannot change people. So there always will be there always will be Platonists and science who think that they have the the, the common good of humankind, uh, etc. There always will be will be um, business people who who want to make profit. Yes. So so and you you have to ensure that they cannot seize a concentration of power as it is now with the state and impose their view on other people. I mean, they are free to express their views. They may convince, you may follow them or you may not follow them, etc. But there must not be a mechanism such that they can impose their views, their intentions on other people. Think to, to think of this great reset story or, or think of, of, of Bill Gates' intentions in his latest book. If there were not a state who can, if they could not use or influence uh, a states that impose this by coercion on other people, well, they can express their ideas. And we'll see where they get, and we would be free to, to say sorry, but, but we are not interested in what you propose. Do you think these people have, um, who try to impose their view of the Platonics, you spoke a bit about the World Economic Forum, now Schwab, <laughs> I mean, yeah. um, do you think they've overstepped in their confidence a little bit during this pandemic, that many people are asking more critical questions? I hope so, of course. I mean, uh, I mean, the, the, I mean I, I'm... A more reliable prediction would be say that would be to say that we may see the end of this fiat money system. I mean, I don't make a prediction when, but it is clear that the amount of debt now as such it can't be paid back. And if people realize that they may, and if they lose the the confidence in the the dollar, the euro as a store of value, then then the system will break down. It's again, it's the same with all this postmodern system. There are no Soviet tanks anymore. It all hinges upon people believing the narratives, and that's why your work is important. That's why we have to speak up and to say, well, start thinking about what is going on there. Use your own mind. Use your own reason. Mm -hmm. And then they are bankrupt. I mean, when you ask critical questions, when you ask for evidence, this COVID narrative bra breaks down, the climate change, I mean, there is climate change, but that the, that, that human-made CO2 emissions um, put an uh, endangered life on Earth, that, that breaks down. Uh, yeah, the, very the, quickly. The, the catastrophe falls apart. If you the, yeah, that's yeah. it, yeah. I, you, you sort of mentioned this yet, and I also want to make a last point uh, before we finish. Uh, you quoted Immanuel Kant um, yeah. in your article, Habti von Nutzen, you know, Verständnis zu benutzen, you know, have yeah. the courage to use your own intelligence or yes. your own mind. Why, why is that ultimately the important lesson? I mean, Kant says that the free public use of reason is the means of enlightenment. 
And by free public use of reason, he means that, 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 that everybody can speak out freely and has the courage to speak out freely. And then these, these narratives, these, 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 these stories that people tell just to, to have power over other people, they will break down. And I think this is right. I mean, our means are intellectual. We try to convince people of our ideas. We try to encourage them to think for themselves. And uh, ideas move can 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 have a lot of effects in the good and in the in the bad sense. So I think Kant is right when he says that the, the free public use of reason is the way to change and to improve the situation. Because the the alternative to reason is violence, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And that's that's always bad, even yeah. if they fight for a good cause. I mean, Definitely. always maybe that may be too general, but but uh, but I mean, in in our societies, violence definitely is not the way. Yeah, that's definitely a good reason. Well, Michel Esfeld, thank you very much for this conversation, and everyone, thank you for listening. Please subscribe.